So good evening, guys. Um, thank you for joining us, and we hope you're going to enjoy our webinar today. And uh, so the idea today is really that we're going to impart a good bit of information around self builds um, for those that are self building and buying. We're going to impart a good bit of information around that, and the whole idea of it is to kind of have, just have a relaxed session um, that you can actually sort of get a little bit of information where there's no pressure on you. And the idea is to sort of hopefully bring you along sort of the first time buyer guide um, and first time builders, because for somebody build, building a house or buying a house, a lot of the mortgage process and a lot of the legal process is exactly the same. So we have sort of split it up um, and there's a little bit of information around first time buyers and first time builders. So your panelists today, guys, is myself on, from Advice First Financial. I'll take you through the first half of this around mortgaging. Um, so we're going to take our time. There's a lot of information here. We may not get through all of it. Um, if you want a little bit of prep before this, get yourself a pen and paper, or write down your notes. If you need to ask questions, there's a couple of ways to do that. You can actually just put up your hand and we can sort of call you out and you can ask your questions or you can type your question in. But we have a series of questions that we're going to actually go through with you as well um, when the session's over. So and then I have Gillian to do sort of legal side of it. So if you have any questions around the legal side from buying or building, Gillian will take you through it. We have timed this for 50 minutes, guys. Um, the last time we did a couple of these, people felt that we didn't get enough time. So we're trying to allocate enough time to sort of get through all the important bits and pieces. So hope you enjoy the session. If you have any questions and queries after it, by all means, come back to us and send us your emails and let us know what you thought of the session. So we'll kick off, guys. Um, so a little bit about who I am. So we're Advice First Financial. We are financial advisors and mortgage brokers. So we're here to take people from the, the very the very start of the mortgage process uh, right through to their life cover and all of that sort of stuff. So today is really about mortgages and, and this is what we're going to have a chat about. So we're going to look at how much can you borrow and the deposit needed and we're going to have a little chat about what lenders are looking for. So what are the challenges and what do we find lenders are sort of looking out for and where you know what sort of what sort of things that you need to look for yourself before you submit your application we're going to talk about some challenges that we see coming up quite a lot and then for self builds we're going to look at the costings and this is becoming more and more important around how you present your costings we're also going to look at some some supports that are out there things like the help to buy scheme first home scheme is there as well we're going to look at some some cash back offers from the lenders and then we're going to have a, just a chat about the the types of paperwork that's going to be needed. But guys, it is fairly comprehensive. There is going to, we are recording this session, so we can send anybody a link that wants it to after it, so you can sort of listen back to it. But let's get to the meat and the bones of it, guys. So one of the biggest questions we get from mortgages is how much you can borrow. And I've kind of split this into two in terms of how much you can borrow from an income point of view and then from a loan to value point of view. And the lending criteria changed last year and for first time buyers and or builders, it is now four times your income. So in theory, if you look at your income and multiply it by four times, that's pretty much what you can borrow. Now, there is a proviso to that and it's kind of underneath and things that can reduce that down, but four times income is a general rule. For second time buyers, guys, that do not hold an interest in another property, we can also get four times income. So it's three and a half times income, though, if you're trading up. So if you have an existing house and you want to trade up and you want to self-build and you want to hold on to the house that you've got, maybe to rent it out, then three and a half times your income is the max that you can actually apply for. Now, the things that may reduce that, and these are sort of calculations that banks run that generally they don't discuss with you, but it it is a way for them to sort of gauge how much they will borrow. And it's not just as simple as four times income. A thing called net disposable income is one that catches a lot of people out. And net disposable income is the income that the banks require you to have and maintain just to live your life. And it's only above that or income above that that they actually lend money on. So for a joint applicant there with no kids, required net disposable income is €2,250 a month. So that's income that's, that you need to live. So it's only money above that that's allowed for debt, whether it's car loan, whether it's mortgage or anything else. So 
If you fall below that, your lending number will be reduced. On a single application, no kids, it's 1150 quid a month. An additional 250 quid a month is added to the requirement for each child. So one of the questions I get quite a lot is, does children have an impact on the amount that you can borrow? Yes, it does, because your net disposable income amount increases per child. So there's less money to pay back a mortgage, therefore there's less money that they'll lend. Proven repayment capacity is another one that can drive down your lending number. And proven repayment capacity is the banks assess what you can pay back and they assess it currently at an interest rate of 6.75%. Even, even though your interest rate might be 3.75%. But what they want to see is the mortgage that you're asking for based on an interest rate of 6.75%. Can you show that you can pay that? So that is one that catches a lot of people out as well. Another thing that may reduce your borrowing amount is existing loan repayments. In fact, any financial commitments that you've got may reduce the amount that you can borrow. So again, all of those are a factor in what you can actually borrow. Then from a, lo from a loan to value point of view, there are some restrictions on this. And again, we kind of separate out mortgages in general to self-build mortgages. A lot of it's very similar, but for first-time buyers, up to 90%. On the purchase price or value, whichever is least. And that's quite important because I've seen a valuation coming in that's actually below the purchase price. And the bank will always go to the least. Second-time buyers with no interest on any other property, up to 90% loan-to-value. So it's four times income or 90% loan-to-value, whichever is first, whichever is the least number. Second-time buyers where you're holding an interest in a property is 80% loan-to-value. And there's a thing now called fresh start. And this is for divorced couples, separated couples, or somebody coming out of bankruptcy. You can borrow up to 90% on the first property purchase after a divorce. So that's an important one as well. For self-builds, very similar. First-time self-builder, up to 90% of the site build and the cost. Sorry, the site and the build cost. Now, there are some variances within lenders, but generally, that's kind of where it is. A couple of banks have small variances to that. The first-time buyer that owns the site, up to 100% of the build cost. So you can borrow the full build cost, but up to 90% of the overall value. So the overall value is obviously the the net value of the property when the house is built. And that includes your own site. Whether the site was gifted or you bought it, it includes that. If you're trading up, keeping your existing house, 80% is the most that you can borrow. If you're trading up, keeping your own, keeping the existing house and you own your site, you can borrow 100% of the build cost, but we're, we're maxed out at 80% of the overall value. So you can see there's a sort of a trend running there. So Buying or building, the loan to values are very similar. The difference being if you own your own site or not can help if you have it, whether it's gifted or not. But you don't need to own your own site. So it can form part of the mortgage. Deposit needed. So obviously from the previous screen, you need a 10% deposit if you're a first-time builder or buyer. 20% for others. So as per the other screen, so whether you're a second time buyer and you're holding an interest in another house, it's 20% of a deposit needed. The deposit guys can come from any recognized sources. It can be your own savings. It can be the help to buy scheme. It can be the first home scheme, or it can be a gift. It can be a gift of money. It can be a gift of a site. It can be a gift from anyone, although we have to have a look at the the gift tax implications coming from, say, if it's not your mom and dad or a blood relation. And it can also be a mixture of any of those. So it can be a pick and mix of any of those that can get to your deposit. For self-builds, same as above. And the site can be used for your deposit. And this is a question that we get quite a lot is, can I use a site as my deposit? And the answer is yes. You don't need a site and your 10% deposit because your, your site is your deposit. And an important fact here, it doesn't actually have to be transferred to you for the mortgage application. So the transfer doesn't actually have needed to be, have taken place. You can still get approved based on that going to be a place. Important note, and Gillian's going to touch on this one as well. If the site is being gifted, get the transfer done prior to planning being passed. And Gillian will address why we would recommend that from both a mortgage point of view, a financial point of view, 
and the legal point of view, and it, it, there's a there's a good saving to, to get that sorted before that guy. So definitely, that's a big takeaway from that. What lenders want to see, so lenders, it's, it's like a CSI investigation, guys, when we go put a mortgage application in, they really, really go into every line of your paperwork. And things that the things that they do want to what they want to see is proven repayment capacity and that stress test that was spoke about earlier. They want to see a good savings record. They want to see your income being paid into your bank account. They want to see rent payments evident on a bank account. Not always possible. And if it's not evident, you need to do a wee bit of work around getting that taken into account if it's not evident on your bank account. And they don't want to see any loan repayments missed. That's a that's a no-no. Um, for self-builds, they want to see full funds to complete the build. A lot of people say, well, listen, I would like to get my build started and I can build it out then as a goal myself. That's a no-no. The banks will not do that. They want to see the, the full money being in place for the proposed build. They will not part fund it. They want to see a breakdown of the cost completed by your architect or engineer. Each lender has their own template for that. They also want to see your planning permission. And obviously, they'll want your architect or your engineer to have their own PI insurance. So those are just standard. Now, modular homes, there's a big shift in, in what's happening around the country with modular homes for self built Usually, with a, with a modular home, there's a full spec for the house pipe and the breakdown of payment plans. So if anybody is talking to a modular home company, you will get a full spec for your house type. And generally, depending... And I'm going to deal with this later on, depending on where you're putting this house up, will depend on whether you have a fixed price contract or not. Challenges. Mortgages in general, online betting. So it doesn't matter whether you're self-building or not. Mortgage, these, these are issues for everybody. The banks don't like to see online betting on your account. They don't like to see referral charges, misdirect debits, uh, none of those standing orders missed all of that. So just make sure that you're managing your account well, guys. The banks look at six months. So when you're presenting your application, they look back six months and that's what they're looking not to see. If you're earning a non-euro denomination, it doesn't matter whether it's sterling or dollar or yen, they will reduce it depending on the lender between 15 and 20%. Adverse credit history, a no-no. If there's adverse credit history there, you are challenged and you're on the back foot. So make sure and always speak with a broker before you go to a bank direct. Do not just drive into a bank and get yourself mortgage, get yourself a mortgage refusal. Unusual transactions, either in or out of an account, the lenders will ask about this. So if you're buying and selling a little bit on Facebook or Facebook markets and you're bringing in money that's unaccounted for, they will ask for it. They will ask you questions about it. So be prepared for that. If you own an accounts or loans outside of Ireland, credit history will be required from that country. So if the bank see a UK transaction or money being transferred, say, to, to a UK bank account, they will ask for a credit history report from that company, that country. And the same as if you have an account in, like we had a lot of doctors or health, health board staff from India, they'll ask for credit history reports from all over the world, wherever they can see you've got financial responsibilities there. For self built. Unacceptable costings are a big one. We see this quite a lot, where people are being refused by the lender because the costings don't fit what the bank accept. And some lenders' cost expectations are higher than others. The range at the minute is running between 170 to 120 euros a square foot. That's what the banks are expecting. That does not mean that you're going to build your house for that guy. So there's generally two things going on, is what's actually going to happen in the field and what your numbers say to the bank. And that's where the trick for self builds. You've got to make sure the numbers work and the numbers are going to be acceptable because they will refuse. Unacceptable site. This is an interesting one where we've had a couple of self builds refuse because they weren't happy with the site. So if the site is in the middle of a farm, especially a family farm, banks will get nervous about that and they're looking at repossessing it. So if the bank is, feels that they're going to have any sort of an issue in take an ownership of the site it may be a reason for them to refuse generally this is not something that we come up against though generally this is not a problem for most people for 99 percent of people this will never be an issue but there are cases where we've seen it being a challenge so be aware of that just when you're choosing your site costings 
lenders want to see funding is coming from to complete the, the project. So whether it's buying or building, they want to see a complete project. They want to see the complete funds on the way in. They won't approve your lending unless they see that. Including associated costs, solicitor costs, architects, development charges. For self-builds, they want to see all this money. They will approve based on money coming in. But you've got to tell them where the money is going to be. So if it's not there at the minute, where is it going to come from? And then you will have to prove that it's there for loan offer. So a lender might and should approve you in principle based on, say, getting a gift of funds from your parents. And then when you go for a loan offer, the funds need to be in your account. But it is possible to get it before that. Including funds that cost overruns. Self-bills, most lenders want to build in a cost overrun. So whatever costings you're putting in place, they'll look for at least a 10% cost overrun. And if that happens, how are you going to fund it is what they're basically looking at. Expected build cost, as I said, running between 170 and 120 euros a square foot, depending on the lender. Each lender has their own costings template. If you want to put an application into a particular bank, know what their cost per square foot is. This is where you should be talking with your broker before you go. Um, because you've got to understand the budget and the budget will drive what size of the house that you can build as well. Modular homes, again, they come with a fixed price. In Donegal, a fixed price is not possible though because they can't complete the build themselves in Donegal. You've still got to engage an architect and you've still got to engage a builder or handyman or somebody to complete the project for, even for a modular home in Donegal. I put a caveat in there, not all modular homes are mortgageable. So if you're looking at modular homes, there are a couple of companies that we are working with that are more mortgageable, but not all modular homes can get a mortgage. So again, check in with us if you are thinking along there. I can tell you the companies that we are working with currently where we can get mortgages for modulars. Help to buy scheme, guys, and I know I'm going through it. I'm just keeping an eye on the time here. So help to buy. It's designed for first-time buyers or builders to help get the deposit, guys. Um, the amount that can be claimed, 30K. It's the lesser of 30K, 10% of the build case, or the self-build cost, or the taxes that you've paid. So it's the lesser of those, whichever is the least number, that's the number that you get. On the bottom there, guys, a very important one, and has caught a few people out for self-builds. You must borrow at least 70% of the completed market value of your house. This includes the gifted site that you got from your parents. So it is very important that you make sure that your numbers fit that or you will fall out of the help to buy and revenue will claim back the money should they have paid it to you. Again, a big one, guys. Other supports, there is a cashback offer. Right, I'm not going to go through that. Have, have a quick look at it. The best of the cashbacks are really the, the Haven one if I, once you borrow more than 250K. It's an interesting one. The rates are still very, very strong. They're not hiding an extra charge within the rates like some other cashback offers from other banks. Terms and conditions do apply around these, so do take advice on them. I'm not going to get into the first home scheme, guys, just purely for time. It is he it is there. It is available for first-time buyers and first-time self built but only for first-timers. Again, there's information here. I can send it on for anybody that's looking for it. Paperwork. Guys, this is where it gets a bit tricky in terms of the paperwork. So can I give a brief outline of the paperwork that's going to be needed? And no surprises really in this um, photographic ID, all of that sort of stuff. Um, divorce agreement separation. If you're going through a separation or divorce, they will want something formalized before they'll approve your mortgage. So something needs to be on paper. Six-month bank account statements that kind of be fairly normal enough. 12-month statements for all loans, including mortgages. This up-to-date credit history report, guys, if you're living or working in the U in the Northern Ireland or the UK, if they see an account anywhere, they'll want a credit history report from there. And then obviously a gift letter. Interesting one, a couple of weeks ago, we had a fairly substantial gift coming from mum and dad. The bank in question actually asked for a statement from mum and dad showing that mum and dad had the gift to give, which was the first for us. So it was an interesting development, but... That seems to be it's creeping in a little bit more. For employed, obviously, there's a salary certificate for your employer to fill out. Pay slips, most recent EDS. So the EDS is really your pay, your P60, or it used to be your P60. If you're working in Northern Ireland, Ireland and Sterling, we'll need recent P60s. 
Self-employed, two years accounts, all the stuff that you would imagine. Two years revenue notice of assessment. So your accounts need to be up to date or as far up to date as possible. And then if you're building, breakdown of build costs, copy of architect's PI, gift letter for site, copy of planning permission. So again, a lot of that your architect can provide. So in general, guys, that's a, a basic paperwork that you be doing, but it is, it, there's a lot in it and most banks just ask for pretty much the same thing. So guys, that's my part of it. Um, again, just a little bit about what I do and how I do it. So Julian is going to take us through all the legal side of it now. So Julian, I'm going to hand over to you. Yeah, my name is Jillian McGough. I'm a solicitor in Michael Henning Associates in Belle Buffet. And um, Pascal in slides just won't move. Give me two seconds. Yeah. I'm better at mortgages than I am at tech, Jillian. No, it's all right. I have some here in front of me anyway. So you should, you, should, you should have it. You should have it there now, I think. So what I take you through is the other costings that should be factored in in self-build. And when I say other costings, I mean... Uh, taxation issues and taxes that are potentially payable to the revenue during this self-build expedition. The, the first one, obviously, is the, um, the stamp duty. And the stamp duty is 7.5%. And that applies to whether you buy the site or whether you're gifted the site. It's 7.5% of the value of the site. If it's a gift, the valuation, or the cost of the site that you're building or you're, that you're buying. So it can be quite a lot, particularly if it's a site that has planning permission already granted on it. Obviously, a site with planning permission is worth quite a bit more than a bare piece of land with no planning permission on it at 7.5%. Um, so that's the first taxation issue that you're going that's going to arise is the stamp duty at 7.5%. And it could be considerable if it's not factored in early enough in this um, expedition of self-building. The second potential, and I say potential because it may not arise at all, is the capital acquisitions tax um, application. And where you might see that is where there is the gifting of the site to uh, a couple. It could be to a child and their spouse or a child and their partner or whatever. Um, the capital acquisitions tax threshold that applies very much depends on who is gifting the site. So if the site is being gifted by a parent to a child and their partner, the child has a huge tax threshold you see there, 335,000. So it, that never throws up a problem for tax for the child. However, the partner or the spouse is a stranger in blood to the gifting party and their threshold is only 16,250. So if you have a site with planning permission already granted, and for toxic, it's 50,000 euros, then the revenue deems that to be a gift of 25,000 euros to the spouse or partner or the cohabity or whoever. They get 16,250 of tax-free threshold of that. They also are allowed a small gift exemption of 3,000 euros. It's the balance then that's taxed of 33%. So there is the potential there for capital acquisitions tax to be also paid in addition to the stamp duty um, where the, the site is gifted. Um, I have an example there, Pascal, if you want to move on to the next slide. Um, so I just used an example to show there. So you have Mary and John gifted a site with planning permission already granted on it, and it's worth or valued at 50,000 euros, and it's coming from the mum. So they're deemed to take the property jointly, but it's a, a notional gift of 25,000 each, if you like. So Mary has a group A threshold because she's the child of the parent. So she's certainly not going to pay any capital acquisitions tax here. But John is the stranger in blood to the gifting party. So he gets the least um, amount of tax free threshold there, 16,250. And I've set out there how it's calculated. So you take off the threshold, obviously, from the deemed amount. You can also deduct the small gift threshold, 3,000 annually. But you can see how it, it raises almost 1,800 there in capital acquisitions tax to be paid also. Um, so yeah, there could be two taxation issues there. And it's just important to realize that and factor that in early. Um, how to get around that, I suppose, is the question. Um, a site without planning permission is obviously worth a lot less. And um, so not only will you be paying 
less stamp duty, but it also lessens the likelihood of any capital acquisitions tax being paid also. So I suppose, yeah, uh, all this homework needs to be done very early on, I suppose, before the, the self-build is in full swing. And um, there's no point in dealing with all these taxation issues and, and realizing very late on in the game that all these taxes need to be paid and you haven't factored in these costs at an early stage. Um, it's not all bad news, I suppose. There are some assistance there for self-builds if you want to move on the slide um, Pascal. The first one is the health device scheme that I suppose Pascal has already touched upon. Um, it's the most popular that I see here um, with self-builds. Um, it applies to the first uh, time builders, new properties being built. Both parties must be first time builders or buyers. Obviously you can't own any other property. Um, you can't be a cash holder. Uh, Pascal touched on that. You have to take out at least 70% of the, um, a mortgage for 70% of the value of the property. The, interestingly, the developer or the contractor who's building the house must be registered for the help device scheme, um, as does the solicitor actually, because there's a part that the solicitor verifies for revenue. Um, so the solicitor also must be registered. Um, the applicant has to be tax compliant. And the entire process is, um, it's very straightforward online. It's done through the my, my account on the revenue Ross system. Um, and they are very efficient in making payment once uh, the application goes through. Um, and as Pascal's already touched upon, it's it's worth up to 30,000 euros. It's the maximum you can claim. Um, so it's it's not all bad news. There is that relief there. Um, the second relief um, that maybe is not so widely known is um, the residential development stamp duty refund scheme. So that's the next slide, Kev Pascal, if you want to move it on. The, Stamp duty that you pay at 7.5%. So this scheme allows for a partial refund of that stamp duty that you pay. Um, you must have used the site to build your main, your main principal private place of residence. Um, and the amount that they give you back is 11 twelfths of the stamp duty that you paid. So you actually go ahead, you pay the stamp duty first, you use the site to build your house, you have to have lodged a commencement notice with the local authority, um, obviously notifying them of your intention to build the property and the property must be completed within 30 months. Those are the main conditions for the refund to apply. Um, so it's a very helpful one. Um, and I see a lot of client, clients would claim that back. And again, it's done on the revenue online system on my account. Um, you want to move the slide on, Pascal? We just go through the stage payment drawdowns themselves, how it works in practice. Um, I find, and most clients find, that the, very, the first and the last stage payments are the most difficult to get through. Um, and I say that because the first one, uh, for the first stage payment to be released, um, you must have everything lined up with the bank and must have ticked all the boxes. So when I say that, the main ones are, you must have the life policy put in place the insurance put in place. Now there's a very particular type of insurance that has to be put in place for self builds. It's it's called under construction insurance. Um, and then all the administrative paperwork must be in order and um, direct debit mandates, um, gift letters, if the site was a gift or if there was a sum of money, you know, gifted towards the, the build. Um, so yeah, those are the first ones that need to be all in order before the first stage payment would be released. That and the architect certificate then. So the architect will certify how much is needed for the first drawdown, and all of that then is sent to the bank. Um, after that, all of the interim stage payments come fairly quickly. All of the ones that are needed immediately after that, they come very smoothly after, until we get to the final stage payment. Now, your letter of offer from the bank always stipulates that there is a retention amount for this, the final release. And that's usually 10% of the loan amount being sanctioned for the build. And that is held back for final release until such time as the architect has certified that the house is built in compliance with the planning permission and has drafted all of his declarations to state that it's in compliance with planning permission, that it's in compliance with the building regulations, and that you um have paid all of the financial conditions that have been imposed in your plan and permission. Usually you'll find that there is um, a development charge within the plan and permission. 
and that development charge is maybe 1200 euro 1500 euro whatever it is and it's a contribution towards services water and sewage services in the area and that's paid to the local authority and that's sanctioned under the planning permission that issues the final stage payment will not be released until the bank of confirmation that that, have been, that has been paid and that can cause a, a delay so i suppose it's about knowing what is needed and have it in a timely manner so that there's no huge delays and all of the, these final um, stage payments being released. Um, so yeah, I'm that's I don't have much else um, to cover here. I think I've covered the taxes and how how the stage payments are released, but I'm happy to answer any queries or questions if anyone has anything there, Pascal. Okay, well, what we'll do, guys, is we have some questions in already. Um, so you'll see on your screens, guys, some of you have already asked a couple of questions, but there's a couple of ways for you to ask a question. There is a Q&A section on your on your browser there. If you want to just type in your questions or if you want to just send us a chat, I'm we're happy to answer your questions live as well. But we've asked people just to send in some of their questions prior to the meeting. And this is some of them that we've got in. So we'll just walk these through as well. Now, a lot of these answers we may have already done, but in terms of a mortgage one, can can you use the site as your deposit? Yes, you can. Um, so whether you've built it or whether you've bought the site or you've been gifted a site, that can be your deposit. There is no issue with that at all. When is it best to apply for the help to buy? You can apply for the help to buy even if you haven't got a house in mind. Um, you can apply now anytime. The help to buy is a tax refund for the previous four years. So whatever number you get in, say, April of this year, it'll be the same number in December of this year. And you, if you haven't drawn it down, you'll apply again then next year. You can apply in the January of the following year for the previous four years, and your number will stay for this year. Depending on the circumstances, how long does the process usually take from start to finish, from application to approval to draw down? Dylan, I may ask you on this one. I mean, from our point of view, in terms of a mortgage side, we're seeing anywhere between three and four months between an application going in and money coming out. Would that be fairly similar on your side? It would. Um, I suppose are we talking, are we still on self-bills here in terms of the, the stage payment releases? Because they, they do differ. Um, no, well, just, of, just on a, just, well, obviously just for a purchase for a second. Yeah. How, how long would you normally see that happen? Yeah, on a straightforward purchase, once um, everything, well, I suppose you have your contracts in exchange and that's usually what takes up the most of the time is that the pre-contract matters that have to be dealt with. But once you requis requisition funds with the, from the bank, um, they are fairly smooth. You can look at a turnaround of a couple of weeks or, you know, a week to 10 days turnaround. But that's as long as everything has been put in order with, you know, from the, yeah, the client. Start, yeah. We're talking about the direct debit mandate, the insurance on the property, the life policy being in place, the valuation still being valid because yeah, yeah, you, yeah. Yourself, the valuation that's done on a property expires after four months so if, if the right. initial valuation yeah, with is. the offer is four months old they look for a new one which can then put back the drawdown release yeah. you know there is there is a there is a lot of moving parts guys in a mortgage application and while you think on the outside that there, there's not a lot happening there, there is there's a lot of moving parts and it, and it is a jigsaw puzzle and from our experience, some of them, some of the times you get the jigsaw built very quickly, and sometimes it just can take a bit longer. But on average, if you're looking into the mortgage world and trying to get started, you need to budget at least three months to get money. And it doesn't matter whether that's a self build or a purchase, because on a self build, it's really down to yourselves. When do you want to actually start building? So, but and then so, the drawdowns yeah. self builds can be extended over the, a period of eighteen months. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you, you'll be you'll be drawing down money on a self build as you build and put value into the ground. So it's slightly different. Yeah. So the next question is: What other factors need to be in place and considered, such as income protection, life cover, etc.? Which is the best and what is necessary? Well, from a from a financial advisor point of view, we would tell you that income protection and life cover they're all needed. But actually, what is needed for the mortgage is a life insurance policy, and that can be called a mortgage protection or a, or just a life insurance. The banks only care that they get their money back if you die. But you might care, well, listen, if I'm out sick, I need to get my mortgage paid. So that's where income protection would come in place. It's not necessary for the mortgage, but it might be necessary to support your own financial security going forward. 
when will the help to buy be paid out? Generally, well, on a self-build, it's paid out once you pull down your first stage payment on your mortgage, whether that's for site purchase or when you have the foundations in. For a purchase on a new building, Gillian, that's normally paid out once you guys on the on the solicitor side finalize out the claim. Finalize the contract and then a copy of the signed contract is needed by the applicant and that's uploaded onto the revenue uh, website. And once they have sight of that, they issue and release the amount of money that's been sanctioned because a lot of the time that money is, is being released towards the deposit monies. So it's it's, it's very efficient, you know, yeah. and the okay. builder accepts that or the vendor accepts that as deposit monies. So the next question is, can I claim the help to buy and first home schemes? Yes, you can. Just watch the numbers, guys, because money borrowed for the whole first home scheme for a self build is not taken into account for the 70% borrowing amount that you must claim for the help to buy. So just be careful with the numbers if you're claiming both. How long does the mortgage process take? As I said, between three and four months, give yourself that time. It can be done quicker if, if, all, the, if all the moving parts come together, but it does take a bit of time. The more questions, how can I ensure that the site is transferred before planning comes through? Julian, that's probably more your side of it. Do you want to just throw some light on that one? Yeah, the site can be transferred at any stage. At any stage, um, I suppose, during the whole self-build process, it can be, I suppose, the earlier, the better. I know people normally make their inquiries first, whether that particular site would get planning. And that's what I see frequently. They make informal inquiries as to whether a certain site or plot of land would get planning. And once they get the kind of nod on that, you know, that's when they decide, well, maybe we'll get this transferred and then apply for the planning permission because the valuation on a bare site, as I said earlier, is a lot less than a site with planning permission, which is valuable and with the increased stamp duty on that. So yeah, the site can be transferred at any stage. Um, I suppose you engage your solicitor early on that. Um, and just, just a wee caveat that from, from the mortgage side of it, guys, for your mortgage application that doesn't need to actually have been transferred, you can get approved while the solicitor is doing, actually working on it. Yeah. Julian, another question for you. When should you engage with the solicitor? Um, I suppose make the inquiries early on. Um Often I find clients come, they look for a quotation first so that they have a fair idea of what exactly they need to pay in terms of solicitor's fees, stamp duty, whether there's any capital acquisitions tax. And then when they're happy with the quotes, you just tell them, you know, they, they've already, I find the clients are already in the mortgage process with you or someone else yes. by the time they come looking for quotations. So they're doing everything kind of together, you know, so... Okay, so I engage with your solicitor as early as possible is the, is the message, I guess? Take it. Okay, and if a site is being transferred, can the people use the same solicitor as, as their parents? No, no, two two solicitors are needed. So one for the parents and one for the transferring, you know, the applicants. So no, two separate solicitors, completely separate for independent legal advice. And just a caveat to that, can it be the same solicitor practice with a different solicitor under the same roof or not? No. Perfect. Is there gift tax on the site transfer? You've already you've already touched on that on your slides there, Gillian. So if you want to just refresh that. Yeah, there's potentially CAT payable depending on the value, depending on the valuation of the site being transferred. And just a reminder that it never throws an issue with a child obtaining the site. It's always, you know, the spouse or the partner that might be being jointly registered because they are deemed to acquire half of the valuation of that site. So like I said in the the, the earlier example, if that's a site of 50,000 euros with planning permission, that, that party is deemed to get 25,000 euros of a gift. Now you're allowed the small gift exemption. They're also allowed to deduct the 16,250 but it still leaves a small amount of tax payable. Well, not a small amount, an amount taxable, which, you know, at 50,000 euros would equate to about 1,800 euros. So, um, the, one, the one way that you can, from a mortgage point of view, guys, the one way to sort of maybe get around a bit of that is 
we can do mortgages where we have one on title and two on mortgage, as long as it makes financial sense and as long as your solicitor agrees to it. From a mortgage point of view, we could have, let's say, that the daughter of the gifters on the site but have two people on the mortgage. And as long as the lender agrees, that, that avoids that gift tax for the, the unrelated party. So there is, again, as long as everybody agrees, the bank and the solicitor agrees, there is a way to work that. Yeah, is and there are banks who do agree, Pascal. There are. I have a couple of yeah. lenders who do agree that. Yeah. And you would find that a lot of clients are perhaps, you know, they may, they may be engaged to be married. And yeah. what can be done thereafter is once they are married and that property that they're living in is their family home, it can then be transferred between the spouses. Correct. Yeah. And the joint names. And the, the good news there is it's done tax free between spouses. So there's no stamp duty between spouses and there's no CAT. So it's just something to keep in mind. Yeah. And there, there's five lenders, guys, in Ireland that do self bills. And by the way, it's an important point. Not all lenders do self bills. Currently in Ireland, there are five. All of them will agree with that to have one on title to your mortgage, as long as it makes sense and there's a sensible reason for it. But again, talk to your lender in a way in or talk to your broker and make sure that you make your application based on that because if your loan offer comes out any other way and then you want to change it, it's a new loan offer has to be applied. So is it possible to get a mortgage on a semi-completed house, guys? This is happening quite a lot. And the answer, the short answer to it is yes. The, the more tricky answer is as long as we can get sign off for the work that has already been done. So let's assume for a second we have a house that has a roof on and that's ready for first fix or second fix, maybe not even plastered. So it's closed, windows and doors and roof on, and that's it. We've had a, that about a month ago where um, we had issue trying to get the sign off because the architect that did the original work was no longer working and no other, no other architect will sign it off. We managed to get that one sorted out, but if you can't get sign off for what's in the ground already, you're going to struggle to put a mortgage on it. But an answer to your question, can it be done? Yes, but you need a good lender or somebody that understands how to do that. Can you get a mortgage to build a holiday home in Ireland of living abroad? No, you cannot at all. No lender will touch that. As we have a couple of other questions after coming in, let me just have a look. Um, so Leanne, can the land be gifted to a child solely to avoid CAT and then a couple apply jointly for a mortgage or must the site be jointly owned? Leanne, good question, and we've already just addressed it there. Um, yes, it can. You can have one on title, two on mortgage. That isn't, that's not a problem. Um, there's no there's no issue with that at all. Guys, that seems to be all the questions we have. Um, so some interesting takeaways from here. Um, from our point of view and from Gillian's point of view and my my point of view, I'm just looking at time. So engage with your mortgage broker early in the process. Um, two reasons I would say that is because I am the mortgage broker, so obviously I'm going to say that. But apart from that, is it's important if ever there was a time to know what your budget is, it's now. Two reasons. If you're buying a house, most of the estate agents won't take an offer from you unless you can show them proof of funds. So you can get yourself approved in principle without a house. So go get your approval in principle and then go shopping. Get yourself approved for the maximum amount of money that you can get. Doesn't mean you have to draw it down. It just means that you're approved for the max. You can draw them whatever you need to draw. But to get an offer into most estate agents, they'll look for that proof of funds. On a self-build thing or on a self-build project, it's important to know what your budget is because that's driving back to the size of the house that you want, that you're able to build because you might want to build the size of a house, but the budget might not be there. So engage your mortgage broker as early as possible. For a purchase, you'll need to have a solicitor once your offer has been accepted. So as soon as the estate agent accepts your offer, they'll ask you for your solicitor's details. So obviously, get in touch with Julian as quick as possible. For self-build, engage the solicitor even earlier in the process. For site transfer, before planning comes through. So get the solicitor involved as early as possible. A good team will help the build process a lot. Your builder, your architect, your solicitor, your mortgage broker, guys, get good people around you here because building a house and buying a house is is very, very stressful. But having good people that can answer your questions, can be there when you need them, and when you ring, they, they return your call and you can speak to them, guys, those will, that will make the process here a lot, lot easier. So, guys, thank you for joining us. Um, I hope it was useful.
Um, we are going to run some more of these as we go. So by all means, give us a shout. If, it, if you have any questions or queries, um, by all means, come back to us. Um, I don't know why that dropped off. But for now, guys, wishing you all the best on your, on your purchase or your build. And give us a shout if you have any questions or queries. Tune in for the next one in about a month's time, guys. Bye-bye.